I'm Dr. Tom Mather, the Tick Guy from the University of Rhode Island. Take it from the Tick Guy. One little episode is all it takes to get a tick. One thing I've learned is that everybody seems to know something about ticks, but unfortunately, once I hear those stories, I can apply my science and I realize that mm, maybe they aren't as accurate as they thought. Sure, they're not exactly wrong, but they're not exactly right either. And when it comes to protecting yourself from ticks, it's really important to be right. And so let's talk about a few of the myths. Most of you are probably looking up at the trees and thinking of all the ticks that are raining down out of those trees. But if you think about it, why would a tiny little tick crawl all the way up into this tree and then try and triangulate itself so that it could drop on its host? So if they made that leap of faith that they were gonna hit the host down here and nail it, you know, how could they do that? They don't even have eyes. So ticks really don't want to do that as a strategy. Instead, they're attuned to the type of host that they wanna get on. So let's say it's a raccoon. It's gonna be about this high. And so the ticks that wanna get on a raccoon are gonna climb up to the top of this and they're gonna be right at the right part where it's the body of the animal. So the biggest part of the animal brushing by. So think about attachment to white-tailed deer. A white-tailed deer is a bit taller. Maybe the belly is about here. So a tick that waited for a deer down here is likely to miss those four little hooves. But one that crawls up about this high would be one that is more likely to find its host. So when people think that ticks fall out of trees onto your head and they have proof because they have the little thing that fell out of the tree onto their head, if we looked closely at it, we'd probably find that it was a insect that likes to live up in trees like weevils. They eat seeds and so they fall out of trees like aphids that suck sap from leaves. They live up on leaves and they fall out of trees when it's windy. Um, so those are insects that are more likely to be up in trees and might get blown out of a tree and they might land on your head, but they, they wouldn't be ticks. So a lot of people think that every tick in the world carries a disease-causing germ, and that's really not true. Um, the ones that carry disease-causing germs are those that in their previous stage, they fed on an animal that was infected and also able to pass the germ on to the tick. So if it's, let's say, a larvae, they hatch out of eggs pathogen-free, but if they feed on an infected mouse or chipmunk, they might pick up a germ or two and then they transform into nymphs and then it's the nymph stage that's carrying the infection. Not every tick that feeds on even an infected animal becomes infected. Some types of ticks are more likely to be infected with the germs they carry than others. Just by comparison, an adult stage black-legged tick in the Northeast and Middle Atlantic states, probably 50% of them are carrying the Lyme disease germ. We think about Rocky Mountain spotted fever in American dog ticks, probably less than 1% of those ticks are carrying an infectious dose of, of germs. So, and so there's a big difference in risk for disease depending on the type of tick that is found biting you. So different types of ticks carry different types of germs. Sometimes people feel that when they're bitten by a tick, the tick has dug in really deep and they keep digging in until they're under your skin the whole way because they don't see anything else. But in those cases, ticks can't really go any further than just their mouth part or their hypostome. It's just the short little piece on the top front end of their head. That's the only thing they can really stick into you. Sometimes your skin becomes inflamed and seems to engulf the tick, so that might say, oh, well, it looks like the tick was engorged, but that doesn't happen very commonly. More likely what happens if you think you've been bitten by a tick or you see one or two, the front two little legs or something sticking out, you've probably scratched the body of the tick off and all that's left attached is the head of the tick. Um, that is much more common to occur. So you may think that the the rest of the tick is under your skin, but really what's happened is you've just scratched the rest of the body of the tick off. A lot of times people think that if 
they have a bullseye rash, that means that they've been infected with, um, let's say, the Lyme disease germ. But you don't always get a bullseye rash. That bullseye rash that's characteristic of Lyme disease um, actually would probably come along about four or five or six days after the tick has finished feeding. And so more often people see a red mark at the bite site even while the tick is still attached and assume that that's a bullseye rash. In that particular case, it's probably just an allergic reaction to the tick bite and it'll probably go away. If it turns into an expanding rash several days later, then you need to go see the, your doctor because that could indeed be um, the rash that's called the bullseye rash associated with Lyme disease. If you see that the red bite mark that is underneath a tick that's still attached starts to expand, um, maybe bigger than a 50 cent piece over the course of a day or two days, that's a time when you should immediately go see your, your physician. A lot of times people think that they're told to use a repellent before they go out into tick habitat. And so they just reach in the cupboard and the repellent most people have is based on a compound known as DEET. It's a great repellent, especially for biting flies, but it's less of a good repellent at preventing tick bites. So what DEET does, you apply it to your skin. If the tick is walking over that part of your skin that you've applied the repellent to, it gets sort of a hot foot and it may or may not fall off. The other thing about DEET is that it is active while it's still sort of liquidy on your skin, but once it starts to volatilize, it's less effective against ticks than it is against mosquitoes. Remember, ticks and mosquitoes find their hosts differently, and so there's no reason to think that the same product is going to work equally well because the product is designed as a confusant for mosquitoes coming in. Ticks don't even have the same sort of host-seeking mechanism, so there's no real reason to think that DEET is that effective. Um, you'd have to reapply it very frequently in order for it to continue to give sort of that hot foot protection of ticks that land on it and crawl across it. To be super cautious, you could apply DEET to your exposed skin, but really the most effective tick repellent is permethrin impregnated into your clothing. It's far more long lasting. Um, you can be out all day. In fact, you could be out for the weekend or even a week or more. And um, the clothing is going to give you the optimum protection against ticks that might land on your clothing. Take it from a tick expert. Be sure to check your facts before stepping outside the next time so that you're always doing the most effective thing to protect yourself from tick bites. <laughs>